And now what you've all been waiting for, the report of the president. My brother bishops, guests, and members of the staff. If the phrase honus horribilis is not reserved for the use of British royalty, perhaps it might be tempting to appropriate for describing the recent weeks. But honus horribilis is not a phrase from our Catholic, Catholic tradition. Our vocabulary instead uses terms such as holy year and jubilee year. For example, the year of St. Paul, which our plenary celebrated last year. There are also years with a special pastoral theme as the year for priests, which we are currently celebrating. For Christians, it is always Annus Domini, the year of the Lord. Our overall perspective is that of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and of being called to labor in his vineyard. The arrest of Bishop Raymond Leahy has been especially painful because of the seriousness of the charges and also because it involves a former member of our assembly, an Episcopal colleague, a close friend, and for a close associate, and for many of us, a friend. As I have previously indicated, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the case itself. These are serious issues that merit careful and thorough investigation by the proper authorities. But we all need to remember that our society believes in the presumption of a person's innocence until judged otherwise by a court of law. However, with, the res with respect to the nature of the issues and questions that have been raised, as bishops, we are united in concern and prayer for each other and all of those whose lives are impacted by the crime and sin of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. These include the victims and their families, the local community and society in general, the Christian community in a special way, and also the perpetrators, as well as anyone who, have made, who has been accused whether justly or unjustly. The past few weeks are a significant reminder of the importance of our, the pastoral priority we have agreed on for almost 20 years. Our diocese are determined to protect and safeguard the human family and the community of faith from serious violations of human dignity. From hey, pain to hope continues to be an important pastoral resource for the church in Canada and around the world as well as being used as a reference by other faith groups and social agencies. The current context is one more important reason why it is opportune for us to take seriously the year for priests. Priests, as well as deacons, are our immediate ministerial collaborators. Their help is essential for us as bishops in sharing our mission of serving the Christian community and providing for its life and well-being. The Second Vatican Council reminded us that the renewal of the Christ's Church involves priests in, I quote, tasks of greatest importance and of ever-increasing difficulty, end of quote. Our assembly thus follows the example of Vatican II for the Council itself, called for a renewed understanding of the priesthood in order that the ministry of the presbyterate be carried out more effectively and that the lives of priests be better provided for in pastoral and human circumstances. The spirit that inspired and guided the Second Vatican Council will also surely assist us in our reflection during the plenary on the Canadian Catholic Organization for Development and Peace. Founded shortly after the Council, inspired by the emphasis on the dignity of the human person, Development and Peace was formed to help carry out the Council's vision of universal concern for all people. As the Council itself declared, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and the hopes and the griefs, the anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts. Pope Benedict XVI, in his recent encyclical, Caritate in Veritate, reaffirms this universal vision of the Council and gives it renewed importance, even urgency, in view of the profound challenges today facing humanity. <clears throat> this teaching of the Holy Father provides an excellent basis for our assembly to discuss the mission and approaches of development and peace 
and to assist it in its efforts to pursue development goals that possess a more humane and humanizing value. In the words of Benedict, integral human development requires a transcendent vision of the person and thus also the involvement of the whole church. Development and Peace has clearly indicated that it wishes to respond to new questions and concerns and is already reviewing the effectiveness of its contractual arrangements with other groups, its surveillance of the projects that it financially assists, as well as its mechanisms for ensuring cooperation and communication with local bishops and other Episcopal conferences. Assisted by the recent encyclical, we have this week a unique opportunity together with the, the, all the church in Canada for a renewing, remandating, and revisioning development and peace. This is a new moment in development work, as the Holy Father indicates, for in our day we see how nations and individuals have grown increasingly inter interdependent and the concerns of faith, society, life, and environment have become more and more interconnected. This vision of integrity and dignity of human life provides the basis for our reflections during this plenary on development and peace, as well as on the leadership role of the bishops in life issues. In his recent 2009 message for the World Food Day, Pope Benedict clearly links famine relief with the church's teaching on the right to life. To quote the encyclical again, the church forcefully maintains the link between life ethics and social ethics, for openness to life at the, is at the center of true development. Pope Benedict makes the pertinent observation that such questions also involve the principles of subsidiarity, mutuality, reciprocity, and freedom of religion, as well as the need to avoid what the Pope refers to as the dangers of fundamentalism and fanaticism. Another major discussion of our plenary will concern the more recent technological developments in the media. These include blogs and websites, as well as what are referred to as the social media, which allow interaction. By their very nature, communications media offer wonderful possibilities to the human community, but they can also be used to ill effect. All of us have lamented how social discourse, including political debate, has too often become dehumanizing and polarizing. To use the word of Pope Benedict's encyclical, websites and blogs, as with other media, I quote, need to focus on promoting the dignity of persons and peoples. They need to be clearly inspired by charity and placed at the service of truth, of the good, and of natural and supernatural fraternity, end of quotation. During our assembly last year, we had the privilege of being addressed by Mr. Phil Fontaine, then National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. At the time, both he and all of us admitted to, to being apprehensive about how his visit among us might be misinterpreted. Despite any anxieties or possible fears at the time, our 2008 plenary began a series of developments that have been most constructive in the relationship of the church with the indigenous peoples of Canada. The historic highlight of this certainly was the 29th of April audience earlier this year that Pope Benedict graciously gave to representatives of the Aboriginal communities and of the church in Canada. His words and welcome have been key in opening up a new chapter for Aboriginal peoples and for the church is particularly in those many areas of our country in which we as bishops are working in close partnership with indigenous communities.